So what we're, the topic for today, and I know other people have um, slides, is to talk about the role of the dentition. in facial growth, and also form and pattern, right? So form and pattern is probably pretty much what I talked about the very, very first lecture we started talking about brachycephalic and dolichocephalic and that kind of stuff. So I'm going to focus right now on the role of the dentition and make sure that, that we sort of get that in our minds, like what, what we want to do. And just like... What I like to think about here is that if, if we look now at that tooth, now what tooth is that that I just drew up there? That's a central incisor, which one? Number eight, there you go. All right, so if we look at number eight and we look at teeth in general, I think it's really important to understand how teeth are so unique in the body. And the, they're unique in the body because they exist in both a septic and an aseptic environment. All right? So if we now look at the alveolar process, and we're sort of cutting this in, right? So we've got sort of the alveolar process here. And it probably doesn't go up that high. It probably goes like here, right? And then, do, I have any, do we ever find any other colors? It's going to be a mono color. No other colors. All right. So, in between here and here, you've got the, the gingiva, right? And then you've got this little thing here, which is really, really important. It goes all the way around, around the neck of the tooth. This thing right here is called the periodontal attachment apparatus. And the reason why the periodontal attachment apparatus is like critical is because that's the barrier between the septic and the aseptic system. So the mouth is on this side, right? So here's the mouth. And that's septic, meaning it has bacteria. Not only it has commensal bacteria, but it also has infectious bacteria. Right? So it's got you know, all that stuff going on, salivary proteins. It's just a bunch of, it's a big bath of, of germs here in the mouth, right? And if you look beyond the attachment apparatus, now you've got the periodontal ligament or membrane. Okay, so you've got the septic part, and you've got the aseptic. And if we now add the pulp of the tooth, okay, this is also aseptic, right? This is the bloodstream, right? So it, that's the aseptic. Just for completeness, you know, you've got essentially the cementum that covers the root of the tooth. And I'll see if I can fit that in there. This where it's nice to have different colors, but I hope to colorize it. And then you've got here the enamel. And you've got dentin. So we talked about this when I did the first lecture, I think Bruce Latimer, I asked, him, is there a, another place where the cells that form the tissue are no longer present? I think Bruce said the hair, right, was another, was another structure. But enamel, the cells that form enamel are no longer there. Right? So enamel is just a crystalline stu structure. And the enamel 
is one of the hardest, if not the hardest, material in the body. Not the hardest material, period, or you wouldn't be able to do a crown operation. But it is, of things, it's way harder than bone, right? way denser than bone. And it's interesting because the enamel can exchange ions with the ambient mouth, right? That's how you get fluoride. So you can, you, can get, you can use fluoride and you can get the fluoride to exchange with the enamel, right? You could also adjust it and it can be incorporated into the enamel in its form. But you can do both ways. So the enamel is sort of cool because it's like it's like the only structure here. It's sort of uh, there's no nerve endings. It's just a it's just a solid hard material that allows you to bite into things without having your teeth break off, right? So enamel's cool because of that. Now the tooth itself then. Most of our dental diseases, the two big dental diseases, are periodontal disease and caries. Right? Malocclusion is not really a disease. So if somebody said, you know, what's a malocclusion, what's not a malocclusion, it's pretty tough to define because we don't have a test for malocclusion. But we have a test for periodontal disease and we have a test for caries, so cancer, things like that. So some disease processes, but both of the big diseases, periodontal disease and caries, have to do with a breakdown of this barrier between the septic and the aseptic system. So all dental diseases that we deal with have to do with a breakdown in the barrier between the septic and the aseptic system. Okay. So if you keep that in mind, that's a good concept to keep in mind as you go through dental school. Because everything that we're going to be talking about is all going to be talking about this contamination of the septic system into the aseptic. It's obvious it carries, right? If it carries, goes through the enamel into the dentin, and if it goes to the pulp, now you've got a pulpitis because you've got bacteria into the pulp. So you've contaminated the septic system you aseptic system with the septic septicemia. So so if you get caries that goes into the pulp, then you get infection here, right? And what's the treatment for that? You drain it out, right? Which is a root canal essentially, right? With a hard tissue. You know, if it's soft tissue, you just poke it and it just the, the bacteria come out. But with a hard tissue, you've got to fill it with something, otherwise you'll get it back coming back in because it's not going to the soft tissue is not going to collapse and heal. So with a root canal, basically you're taking out this, and now you've eliminated at least one of the aseptic components, right, of the tooth. Now it's sort of an inert thing. Periodontal disease has to do with the breakdown of the attachment apparatus between the gingiva and the neck of the tooth. If we get that, what happens is bacteria start to creep down in here Right? And what do we call that? Periodontal disease. Where you get loss of the attachment, now you can take, you know, if you take a, a, a periodontal probe and you stick it in a normal tooth, right? That probe gets stopped by the attachment apparatus. Unless you're real new to it and you just like sort of poke it in there. But, you know, normally you're supposed to stop when you feel that resistance. Okay. And that's why you don't want to do it with an explorer. You want to have it has to have a blunt end because you're looking for the soft tissue thing there. So when you first start, you know, you got to be a little careful. But the idea is that the, the, it gets stopped by the attachment apparatus. And when it doesn't get stopped, what happens when you get this? Well, you get breakdown of the bone because now you get breakdown of the bone, right? And now you get these big, wide things like this. And there's a new attachment apparatus up there. Well, now the problem is, is that you've ruined the system, right? Because you've got now septic areas able to get in there, and guess what? It's hard for the patient to get in there and clean that. Right? So the whole idea of brushing your teeth is trying to get 
the bacteria out of the areas where they can cause breakdown of this septic aseptic system, right? So that's why you clean the bacteria off the teeth, right? So if you create a problem here where you can't clean it easily, that's why it's a problem, all right? Normally, teeth in their natural state, in their natural state, okay, are fairly self-cleaning, especially the crowns, and then you need to clean where? Right between where the, where the rubber meets the road, which is essentially where the gingiva meets the enamel, and you get that interface between the two, okay? So, the septic and the aseptic system. And the breakdown of that causes dental disease. Why are we talking about this in facial growth and development? Because the tooth and the role of the dentition comes out of the fact of this unique thing about how the tooth and the bone never become one. So teeth are always independent of the bone in the face, always, throughout your whole life. Normal teeth never get stuck to the bone. Okay, so normally teeth never get stuck to the bone. They're suspended in this periodontal ligament, or sometimes people think of it as a membrane, but it has a certain amount of give to it. Now, from a physiologic standpoint, why do you think that there's, we need that little bit of give? Any idea? When you bite down. When you bite down? Like the zone of compression that it needs to. Why do we need that from a physiologic standpoint? I like so your you thinking. So you don't break your tooth. There you go. So you don't break your tooth. Exactly. So we've got that whole system in there because there's nerves in the periodontal membrane, right? So that when you hit that, if you bite down and you hit something that you can't bite through, it automatically releases the muscles of mastication, right? so you don't fracture the teeth. So the periodontal membrane or periodontal ligament serves as this shock absorber between two hard tissues. What other tissue sometimes serves as a shock absorber? Cartilage. Cartilage, okay? Now why didn't we just use cartilage here from a physiologic standpoint? This could be a question on the final, that would be a good one. But let's think through it. So if that was, why, 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 what makes the periodontal ligament, the membrane unique? Why couldn't we just use cartilage? Because you said shock absorber, right? And you could probably have it innervated. And you probably could get the proprioception. Now you just put a few nerves in it, it'd probably work. Don't the ligaments stretch down? The cartilage can do that. They, 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 they could like absorb pressure, but the ligaments like allow stretching. They allow stretching. I think cartilage, you, you could say that if cartilage is under tension, I mean, I think if you think about it, probably it could allow some compression resorption. I don't, I'm not sure. I think the key is, the key is, 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 is what has to happen with teeth. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have a specialty called orthodontics. Cartilage wouldn't be able to move. Yeah. Yes, cartilage wouldn't be dynamic enough to allow for tooth movement to occur. The natural tooth movement that needs to occur during growth, right? So the natural movements that need to occur require sort of a dynamic attachment apparatus, which is the periodontal ligament. So it's fibers that are sort of stuck into the alveolus and sort of stuck into the cementum, and it functions a little bit like cartilage in that it's, it's pressure tolerant, okay? And in fact, when you do incise, it's interesting because it, create, it, it turns a pressure into a tension, doesn't it? Because the tooth goes in and it puts tension on that. So actually, it turns pressure into tension as a transducer, too. We take advantage of that in orthodontics because we exert a force on the tooth and we create that tension and then we, we, trigger, we trigger tooth movement. But naturally, teeth have to move also. Why do teeth have to move? Why do teeth have to move independently of the bone? Anybody have an idea? Why is it important for the teeth to move independently of the bone? So the, other than to create orthodontics, right? So other than to make a specialty called orthodontics, but why 
that otherwise we wouldn't have be able to move the teeth. But why, from a physiologic and growth and development standpoint, is it important that the teeth are able to move separately from the bone? So you can lose them, that's the deciduous teeth, right? So the deciduous teeth have to be resorbed by the eruption of the permanent tooth, okay? But it's not only the deciduous teeth that have the periodontal membrane, they also all the permanent teeth, even ones that are not succedaneous, like the first molar, that still has a periodontal ligament. So what's the reason why, now this is where you need to think, okay? When does the upper first molar, also called the six-year molar, erupt? Around six. All right, there you go. All right. So everything else is that time. Everything else it, it erupts, and 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 the thing about teeth, and the thing to remember with teeth, especially the anterior teeth, but also the posterior teeth, is that teeth erupt fully grown. So a six-year molar erupts into a six-year-old face, but it's the same size as your six-year-old molar now. In other words, your six-year-old molar erupted when you were six, and it's the same tooth in your head right now. Which is why kids that get upper incisors, always, their teeth always look too big, right? Because they've got like a, you know, there's this seven or eight-year-old with a, with a 22-year-old <coughs> size tooth. And they don't have a 22-year-old size head yet. Right? So their teeth always look big, because they are, they're big, they got a fully grown tooth. So, you know what they say about dogs, how dogs grow into their feet, right? So teeth, people, they grow into their teeth, right? So humans grow into their teeth. They grow up fully grown and then the rest of the face grows around it. So the reason why you need this dynamic process is that teeth are erupting fully grown and the rest of the face isn't finished growing yet. And we know from our understanding of the growth and development of the face that bone can only grow on surfaces, right? Why can't it grow interstitially? That was a question on the, on the midterm. It can't grow interstitially because it has a calcified matrix. That's the answer to that question, okay? So bone can't grow interstitially because it has a calcified matrix. So, but does that mean that bone doesn't change? No, absolutely not. Okay, absolutely not. We've got two basic types. We've got cortical drift and we've got displacement. Both are changes that occur in bone, right? The cortical drift is a surface phenomenon. The displacement is the movement of the whole bone. The fact that the teeth are not connected to the alveolar process is related to the whole idea of surface growth of bone or surface change of bone. Because essentially, it's a free surface around every tooth, allowing each tooth to move independently of the bone, because bone can only change on the surface, and luckily, teeth, by their design, have created a free surface at every interface with the bone. Okay? And it's sort of a complex interface, because like what we talked about there, cartilage might give us the, the, the shock absorption that we need, okay? But it wouldn't allow for the movement that we need, that you need. So it's a really a complex structure, and it's a very complex interface where we talk about how teeth and bone are intertwined like that. We talked about the two major dental diseases and how they're actually related in some way to this idea of the septic and the aseptic environment, and especially periodontal disease is related to this idea of the attachment apparatus separating the septic from the from the aseptic system. Okay, so so this sort of breakdown like this, and we talked about well, if you didn't have this shock absorber, you'd be breaking off your teeth. Okay, and because we wouldn't have that proprioception. So very important that you understand this point, and that is in normally teeth never. This is normal teeth, never become attached to bone. Because if they do, it breaks the whole system, right? 
Because the whole idea of the teeth is that they're able to move independently. So if they become attached to bone, that's an abnormal situation. So how does it work for animals? Pardon me? I'm sorry. Uh, how does it work for animals? Well, mammals and most of, most of the other, they have, they have, they have a periodontal ligament. But if you look at reptiles, that's a better question for Bruce, because he's like, you know, physical anthropologist. But I mean, if you look at sharks, they don't care if they break their teeth because they got multiple rows. And the same thing, sometimes the, uh, the tooth is actually an outgrowth of the bone itself. It's just a sharp end, and if it breaks off, it can regenerate. So there's other ways that people could do it. Think about rats. They have continually erupting incisors, and if they don't wear them down, they'll erupt and end up sticking them in here. So there's always some way to make up for that. But a lot of times, all teeth, even rodent teeth, have periodontal ligaments. Yeah, I was thinking because in the end, animals they have to grow in the same way as we do. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, I I noticed that they have they haven't built it. like they have their teeth attached. To... Only reptiles, not mammals. Okay. Reptiles might sharks. Again, that's a good question for Bruce exactly. Where I know that teeth, from an evolutionary standpoint, Bruce has said that they come from scales. So they're evolutionary related to the scales for fish. Now how it gets to teeth, Bruce is gonna to have to explain. All right, good question. He's coming back for the embryology point, so save that question. But all the mammals that I know of, even you know, rabbits, rats, you know, certainly primates, things like that, all have periodontal ligaments, all have, all have this design. And th because the reason is just like you said, it's like the endoskeleton versus the exoskeleton. If the face has to grow, you've got to have these sutures, you've got to have the periodontal ligament space to allow these changes to occur. Okay. So we've got this cool structure. There we go. All right. Not to get underneath on board. So we've got this really cool structure that has the teeth separated independently, and they never become attached to the bone in the normal state. In general, in general, <coughs> if we look at the usual movement of teeth in the absence of any sort of external force, whether it be a thumb, or it be an orthodontic bracket, or any sort of external forces. In the absence of all of that, teeth are still gonna move, okay? So if we look at the teeth, here, make it a class one, I guess. I had a really great question that I didn't use on the midterm because I think people were ready for it, but I'm saving it for the file. All right. So this is, you know, as we say that you probably don't know, but that's the class one molar relationship. Maybe you had that already. Mesial buckle cusp in the buckle groove. All right. And I'm not going to draw all the teeth in between. This challenges my artistic ability. <coughs> so imagine that we have some place that we call the occlusal plane. The occlusal plane, I guess, in my definition, is where the teeth come together. Right. So a tooth. If this is the occlusal plane, the occlusal plane in the deciduous teeth, if you're five years old, what establishes the occlusal plane? Where the deciduous teeth come together. It's pretty obvious, right? Because that's where the teeth come together. That's called the occlusal plane. So if, even if you have all deciduous teeth and the first molar is erupting, okay, generally erupts 
sort of mesioangular like that until it gets into the mouth. If you have the occlusal plane, a tooth is considered to be erupting erupting, actively erupting, until it hits the occlusal plane. Until it hits the occlusal plane. Once it hits an opposing tooth, generally the tooth will not erupt. Okay? So what stops a tooth from erupting is general. Does that make sense? So eruption is the process of the development of the tooth coming through the alveolar bone, coming into contact with something opposing it to stop its, to stop its movement. In a normal occlusion, what stops the eruption of the teeth is the opposing tooth. So what do you think happens if there's no opposing tooth? It's super eruption. It's super eruption, if you like to call it that, right? The tooth erupts. Now, notice that in the general, this is an interesting thing you probably haven't thought about because you're just starting out in dental school, but maybe you have thought about it. But in general, a tooth contacts two other teeth, not just one. So in general, a tooth contacts two other teeth, two opposing teeth. Teeth also contact, you didn't think about that. It has a mesial and distal also, but except if you're the third molar, you don't have anybody, anything distal. But, but I'm talking about occlusally, most natural dentitions, the teeth will contact two teeth in the opposite arch. So one tooth will be two. Right? So, so it's a little bit of a fail-safe and then if you're missing just one tooth, as long as you have some occlusal contact, you won't see that super eruption. But a tooth that doesn't have any opposing tooth, you will get that tooth to continue to erupt. And that is essentially a physiologic process that causes a pathologic result, right? But it's not like there's anything wrong. That tooth's just doing what it does. Tooth, they don't think. Teeth don't have little brains where they think, I'm going to be crooked, or I'm going to be impacted, or I'm going to stop erupting. Now they're just responding. So the teeth are erupting until they, until they meet an opposing tooth, and then they stop, and they usually stop about the same place, creates the occlusal plane. Now, at six years of age, or seven years of age, we know that the face isn't done growing. And we're going to get this growth of the face out from underneath the brain. And what direction is the face being displaced? Forward and what else? Downward. Okay. Now there's another one on the next term. Downward and forward. Okay? Downward and forward is the air is the direction of displacement. So we're getting displacement downward and forward. As we get displacement of the mid-face and the mandible downward and forward, we get the remodeling activity upward and backward, right? So you get the remodeling upward and backward. So in general, the posterior of the maxilla, the anterior border of the ramus, and the posterior border of the ramus is depository, the anterior border is resorption. So in general, we're seeing this displacement downward and forward. With the concomitant sort of situation here, and the mandible's a little more complicated because of the ramus doesn't have a free end, right? So you're getting the displacement and then you're getting the remodeling. What's happening here at the level of the occlusal plane as patients grow? What do you know just from observations? I mean, you knew that you had six-year bowlers and now you're in dental school. Did you ever have a time where your teeth didn't really come together? Yeah. 
not unless it was something strange, right? Pretty much the teeth maintain the occlusion, right? Now you might have a second deciduous molar that's lost and now you've got a little bit of time until that second bicuspid erupts through the occlusal plane. But in general, we maintain that occlusal plane as in fact the face is getting displaced downward and forward. So we maintain the occlusal plane, maintain the contact of the teeth. Now, the teeth have already erupted into occlusion. The process that we call dental drift <coughs> is the process where the teeth move within the alveolar bone in response to the downward and forward displacement of the maxilla and mandible. So the difference between eruption and drift, that teeth erupt to the occlusal plane, and once they come into contact, they are no longer erupted. As the face grows, now teeth are drifting. As the face goes downward and forward, the teeth drift. In what direction do teeth naturally drift? Towards the occlusal plane. So the mandibular teeth are drifting superiorly the maxillary teeth are drifting inferiorly towards the occlusal plane. Therefore, you maintain the occlusion of the teeth because of this drift. Now, You've got now this is number nine, right? I like to mix it up. Okay. And we've got number eight. And your patient is now 11. So 8 and 9, I'm not going to draw all the other teeth that are there. 8 and 9 are both there. And they're a rambunctious youngster. Girl climbing on the monkey bars, hanging upside down, being really crazy. Goes ahead and fractures this tooth till it's non-restorable and in fact it's lost. Now I'll put in the lab on side. Okay. Now patient comes to your office. Bloody mess. Clean it all up. You know you can try to implant the tooth if you, you know that's that'll be later, all those things. Can't be saved. Now you've got a missing tooth in the patient's Let's just say 12. What do you do? Clinical question. What do you do? <coughs> Pardon me? Nothing. Like make a space. Yeah. Make a space maintainer? Yeah, because there's a movement. Like, it needs a movement. You do have movement. If you don't do anything at all, you may see mesial drift, is what you're saying, right? Okay, because that, that's another type of drift where it's just be on So probably you're going to want to replace this. So what are you going to replace it with? Probably some sort of removable appliance, exactly. And why? 
because exactly you can't do an implant because they're not done growing because what is the difference between this dental implant and this tooth right it does not have a periodontal ligament so a couple things one it doesn't have a periodontal ligament, so it's going to be more at risk for if the restoration has to be, the occlusion has to be checked, right? Because it's easy to fracture, right? You don't want to do that. It doesn't have a periodontal ligament, so the other function of the periodontal ligament is to allow movement of the teeth. So the tooth won't naturally, physiologically drift. How about if I put a bracket on it here, like that, and I try to move that orthodontically. Can I move it orthodontically? No, because orthodontic tooth movement requires a periodontal ligament space. So, an implant. Titanium, I guess we'll say. That's the only legal material like, in the United States. A titanium implant, it replaces no tooth. Right? So an implant doesn't replace a tooth. An implant replaces no tooth. Otherwise, you might as well have all your teeth on, just have implants, right? You don't have to worry about the contamination of the septic system, all that sort of stuff. All right? But an implants replace no tooth. Just like dentures, they don't replace teeth, they replace no teeth. Someone needs a denture, not because they want a replacement for teeth, it's not a replacement for teeth, it's a lousy replacement for teeth. It's a relatively good replacement for no teeth. All right? Now, most of the time, these implants in the anterior become very difficult to determine when the right time to do it is because what do we know is going to happen over time? We know that we're going to get vertical drift of these teeth. So the whole dentition, the maxillary dentition is erupting towards the occlusal plane. So the maxillary dentition is erupting down, the mandibular dentition is erupting, is erupting towards the occlusal plane, so it's erupting up. So at what age at what age are you going to replace this tooth with a dental implant? And how are you going to figure that out? By x-rays? X-rays. Yeah, you have to like, figure out how uh, uh, a comparison between a year when there's no longer growth. That's, I think that if you want to be the most careful, you take some sort of an x-ray where you can compare the x-ray at time one and time two and see whether or not there's been any change. Okay? The other thing you might do is you might say, at what age, for most humans, is the skeleton sort of mineralized? 25. So at about age 25. So up until about age 25, you've got to be pretty concerned because dental implants are really, really successful at their integration with the bone. So once you put a dental implant in, it integrates with the bone, it's highly successful. Which is good and bad, right? Because if it didn't do such a good job, they'd be easier to remove. But now to remove them, you've got to actually take out all the bone like this. To take it out in a block, if you have to take it out, it's a big mess. Right? So it's sort of important not to jump in and do it too soon. When is, not, when is too soon? We really don't know. I mean, age 25, you could still get burned with a guy that's still growing. You know, because a millimeter is going to be noticeable, right? or two millimeters, there's lots of clinical questions that revolve around, around this sort of thing. But I think to remember that the implant does not replace a tooth and that you've got this fact, this, this phenomenon called drift, 
and we talked about vertical drift. The other type of drift, and if I look at the mandibular arch, I'm missing a tooth here. We're looking, standing down, looking at the mandibular arch. So we talked about drift occurring towards the occlusal plane, the other natural movement of teeth, gentleman mentioned in the back, and that's towards the front of the mouth, and it's called mesial drift. Mesial drift. Mesial drift is the eruption, or the movement, not the eruption, but the movement of teeth towards the mesial, or obviously anterior part of the mouth. Now, interestingly, according to Bruce Latimer, humans are the only primates that exhibit mesial drift. So uh, unlike vertical drift and unlike other problems, mesial drift is unique to humans. So that would be maybe the question on the final. That would be a good one. No one knows the answer. No, not that it would be fair. Although it would be a good question for the essay, because there would be no answer, which I, the, I can tell you the essay questions will have like sort of no right answer, they'll just be thinking questions, right? Like, why do humans have mesial drift? And then you can like go over the reasons why. We don't know why, really. We just know they do. We don't know why. That's what makes it a good question, right? That you have something to write about. If it, you know, it's not going to be like, you know, something, something like, you know, just that boy, there's a right or wrong answer, that wouldn't make any sense. Because the idea is to try to integrate the information that we have to make it consistent with what we found. So mesial drift occurs in humans. Mesial drift is probably, probably the reason why people get low, crooked lower. Probably. But it doesn't explain the whole thing because you've got, you've got mesial drift in the next level too. I'm not sure I totally buy that, but it's okay. We can, we can, that would be one reason we could, we could argue about it. That's what the, the essay questions will be things that we could argue about. So all I want to do is to know that you guys know enough to argue about it. To come up with some cogent, a cogent discussion of a topic that I think you should be able to discuss knowledgeably now at the end of this course. And so that'll be sort of our goal. So we've got 10 minutes left, I'll save it for questions. Uh, this is, the form and pattern stuff is pretty much just the first lecture that I gave you. I'm sorry we didn't get the, the uh, tape on that one, but we were still working. We were going through the system, but all the other ones should have it. All right, other questions about the answer? Kind of outside the scope of this, um, if someone comes into your office and they got an implant too early and you have to take it out, is there an implant option to uh, yeah, there's, there's, you can do, the, the answer to this question, clinical questions, I don't do a lot of any implants, but, but my understanding is that they have implants that are slightly different designs in case you do have to take one out. The other thing, what's going to happen when you take that out, what's going to happen with the bone? Bone's dynamic, right? So bone will sort of fill in too. So you might not need a, necessarily a wire, but you'll probably have a little divot at the top. If there's a real problem in the answer. It's a good. It's a good question that needs a better answer than we have right now. Um, are dental implants technically considered part of the system? That's a good. That's a good question. Are dentin and enamel considered part of the septic or the aseptic system? I would say dentin and enamel protect the aseptic system from the septic system in the mouth. So they're they're at the interface, sort of like the attachment apparatus. I don't think, well, you know, you don't, you know, just because you have a, a caries that breaks through the enamel into the dentin, a lot of times you don't have, you don't have a problem pulpitis wise, it's still reversible, it's not until you get the contamination here. So this could be what you do with your, you know, if you're, if, if once it gets through the enamel, right, and it gets into the dentin, at that point, Generally, people feel that you should restore that, right? You should remove that because you can't clean it anymore, right? Once it's in just the enamel, you could try to do, you know, you can still clean it or remineralize it or whatever. Once it gets into the dentin, it sort of spreads along 
the DEJ. I don't know how much of this you know anymore. It's the DEJ position that we're here. But it sort of spreads along the DEJ like that, and you can't really get it. Okay. So the question is, you know, what's the what's the right treatment? So I would say that that dentin and enamel are barriers here between the between the pulp and the and the septic system. Go ahead. Okay. You had a question next. He, he was first. Sorry. Um, if you were to do some seed where there's there's no more occlusion, yes. you want them to slide back up again. If you what? If you were to do some teeth where. Oh, okay. That's a great question. Well, it, 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 it's actually a great question. Maybe we should use it on the final, but anyway. So let's just think through it. What stops teeth from erupting? Occlusion. Oh, How about age? Does age stop teeth from erupting? Do teeth ever become permanently attached to the bone? No. So at any age, if you would have lose that potential, you could potentially still see a rupture of the teeth. It's a, it's a great question, really. Yeah. So you see what I, the, the problem with clinical questions and actually knowing the scientific answer is is that you don't know that you know somebody loses a tooth but they chew on pencils all the time or their tongue gets in there or whatever you know, something goofy you can't figure out so so sometimes in a patient it doesn't always follow the rules because patients can do weird stuff. So how exactly is it Okay, how exactly does the tooth move? Again, people don't understand exactly why a tooth why a tooth starts erupting or why it stops erupting. What we do know are two things. One is teeth only erupt at night. Okay? So teeth just like everything only erupt at night. Alright? There's been good studies out of the University of North Carolina that show that teeth only erupt at night. So 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 during the day your teeth don't erupt. Okay. Why teeth erupt is, that, is, a, is, a, is a really good question, you know? I mean, the natural tendency is for things to grow and expand, and so that must be part of it, but I don't have the answer to that, you know, why they, why they erupt. But the fact that they only erupt at night, we do know, okay? The fact that they erupt throughout your life, uh, we know that. Other questions? Is that during the night or while you sleep? You know, I'm guessing it's, Probably like fewer awake. Yeah, nice. then you die eventually, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't sleep, but, but so my guess is that it's probably while you sleep, probably. But I don't know the answer to that. You know, in other words, if you if you work at night and you slept during the day, would your teeth still erupt? That's a good. That would be problem. All right. Anything else? All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.